In the recent years, perhaps since 1980, the transformation of astronomical research, primarily due to the invention and augmentation of the microcomputer, has been truly spectacular. This presentation was shown, designed primarily to show you uh, how much this change has, has affected things. Uh, and it compares amateur work with professional work in, in a way that the uh, youngster perhaps might appreciate. So I hope you enjoy it. In 1900, the telescopes were primarily near cities, as it was very difficult to to travel very far. The roads were very poor, cars were really non-existent, and so on. There weren't very many of them uh, because the current version of government-driven research really hadn't been started. Uh, they were smaller due to manufacturing constraints and costing, primarily all made as refractors. And the study of stellar spectra, the study of the spectrum of stars, was only getting started for two reasons. One uh, was that um, many of the observers were positional observers looking for the mo movement of objects, trying to understand the universe that way. Uh, but in 1872, the Harvard Observatory put uh, Edward C. Pickering in charge of things, and he began to take a lot of spectra. But of course, this also was a problem because the sensitivity of the film was uh, glass plates was so poor. And then you take a very dim object like a star, even though it's made brighter by the telescope, and then you spread that light out quite substantially, meant that only the brightest stars could be measured. But by 1900, things were getting a little better. But there was still a lot of astronomers who were mostly interested in, say, double stars orbiting around other stars and uh, positional astronomy within the solar system and so on. And this uh, meant that the photography and the science side of it was perhaps still in its early years. The detectors as they were, were chemically treated glass plates. So most of you are now beyond the age of what we call um, camera film, which was a plastic spool of material that was put inside a camera that was photosensitive. But the film is really not the plastic piece of material that's being put in the camera but rather the chemical that is on it. Uh, they use glass plates because the glass plate glass is pretty much dead flat. So if you put that into the telescope and you had a more or less flat focal plane, then you could be pretty comfortable that the entire image would be in focus. As you can see on the slide here, the sensitivity of these was pretty poor, about 0.5%. This meant that one photon and perhaps 200 would actually be recorded. The blue photons did a little better, and the red ones uh, was almost a waste of time in the beginning. Uh, of course, glass plates are fragile uh, and uh, cannot be, uh, if you break them, that's the end of it. So they're not easily transferred. So to, to, to take this data, for example, the data taken at Harvard by Pickering's people, you're not going to just simply say, okay, well, uh, we're gonna send it to California for six months. That's not gonna happen. And so professors would often have to second themselves to these types of libraries to get the data they required. And of course, when you do chemical film, you um, after you make the chemical development process to show the image, uh, you can't fix it after you're finished. Uh, if there's a mistake made or whatever, uh, that's, that's the way it stands. And so some pictures here we have, uh, just to give you some illustration on the situation at the turn of the century. This is the Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, which was run by the University of Chicago. Uh, the large dome on the left is housing the uh, refractor, and you see it uh, inside on the right, upper right, and you see it on the left, uh, the aperture of the telescope beside astronomer Van Biesbrock, who measured 32,000 and change double stars. And of course, if you do this over time, you can begin to see how the stars are orbiting each other. And this allows us a way to measure the mass of stars directly, which of course is an important observation. Now draw your attention to the upper right image for a moment. The um, floor, as you can see there, uh, notice that where the chairs sit, uh, that entire floor will raise itself right up to the 
a balcony where the doors are uh, up higher there. And this is necessary because the telescope is so long that as you swing it to to look at different parts of the sky, the end of the telescope that you're used to using could be, you know, 10 feet above the floor. And so they actually have motors that drive the uh, floor up and down. Uh, also, if you just see it at the right side of the image there, there's a set of what looks like stairs. This is what we call an observer's chair. And what would happen is, in addition to floor movement, this could be positioned at the base of the telescope and the, tel and the astronomer could sit at whatever level is appropriate to view through the telescope. Even if the telescope is at the right location, uh, it's big enough that you would have uh, different things attached to it in different locations that you might have to move around a little bit. Notice also that the floor, therefore, is isolated from the pier, the post that holds the telescope, and this reduces vibrations that get transmitted up the mount. The picture you see in the lower right corner is that of the crater Copernicus, um, one of the more prominent craters on the moon. That's approximately 60 kilometers across. And so we could put most of Toronto in there to give you a perspective. And that picture was taken by this telescope. If we fast forward now 60 years of so three full generations of professionals, we can see that the changes are arguably incremental. There certainly have been changes. 1960 is a long way from 1900. We now have telescopes on some mountaintops uh, to take advantage of the much better astronaut, astro, astro, atmospheric conditions you find there. We have far more astronomers. Um, ever since the uh, post-war uh, boom, there have been a lot more people going to school and taking in technical fields. Uh, the telescopes are now largely mirror-based and are roughly about four times larger than they were at the turn of the century, maybe slightly more. The biggest telescope uh, still is in the neighborhood of um, five meters, the Mount Palomar Telescope, and of course the Yerkes refractor was one meter, so you know four or five times larger. And this is of course by diameter. They're all equatorially mounted, which means that you will see this in subsequent slides. The telescope now could track the sky by simply just um, a motion in one axis. So it's set up that way to make the tracking system easier. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of travel because there's no way to transmit the images and data very effectively between um, observatories and uh, universities where the professors are. So people had to pack up and go uh, regularly to the telescope. The Southern Observatory was about to start. Uh, this was uh, going to originally be in South, um, South Africa, but of course the politics there got complicated and they decided to move it to Chile. Now the reason, of course, is that if you, the way the Earth's oriented in its axis in the galaxy is that the Southern Pole, if you will, points roughly towards the center of the galaxy, whereas the North Pole generally points to one of the arms uh, further out. So from the northern hemisphere, where most of the astronomers are located uh, at that time, uh, you cannot see the center of the galaxy, which is, you know, arguably of great interest. So by placing telescopes in the southern part of the Earth, you can now have a look to do there. And that is what has happened primarily in Chile and in Australia. The detectors have improved somewhat. Uh, the Glass plates are now larger than they used to be. Uh, the emulsions are better. Incremental improvement, maybe one or two, perhaps 5% instead of 0.5, which is 10 times, which is nice, but still not, nothing too spectacular. Uh, the spectrographs are now much more effective, uh, much better glass, and are attached to much bigger telescopes. And so we are getting uh, spectra from many different objects, uh, perhaps two or 300,000 now in that neighborhood. Uh, the science of photometry, measuring the brightness of stars, is uh, was becoming that way at the turn of the century uh, in the sense that we use actual full electronic detectors with no observational bias. That is completely now electronic uh, by 1960. Radio astronomy had its beginnings. Uh, there was a little bit going on before the war, but overwhelmingly after the war, we had a lot of leftover radar equipment from the Army and uh, mostly it was surplus, and so universities and professors got their hands on it <clears throat> for modest amounts of money, and a significant amount of initial work was done in the 1950s, with the Australians really taking the lead in that area.
So here, just have a couple of pictures. The Mount Palomar Observatory, you see there on the left, houses the largest mechanical telescope in the world. It was built uh, <clears throat> in the 1930s, and then progress was halted because of the war and commissioned in 1948. It is a full five meter mirror and is still a magnificent instrument. The reason that uh, I put it here is there are certainly bigger telescopes today in the sense of the size of the mirror system. But this telescope was built entirely in a, math, in a mechanical way without the use of computers uh, um, to position and maintain the mirror. And it's probably one of the finest uh, large instruments ever constructed by humankind. Uh, the precision of this telescope's structure and, and what have you is really close to that of a mechanical wristwatch. It's pretty quite remarkable that, that it was built that way. Uh, on the right, you see a very beginning of some of the radio telescope work that was done, and the British also did a fair bit of it too, uh, given the weather, uh, more success in that direction. And of course, what we want to be able to see is more, not just the visual part of the spectrum, but the radio, the infrared, the microwave, the ultraviolet, the gamma ray, the entire electromagnetic spectrum, because that's going to give us way more information on these astronomical objects of all sorts. By the turn of the 20th century, the telescopes in the southwestern United States were the largest in the world. They were the results of the remarkable efforts of George Ellery Hale. He was the son of an elevator opera a designer in Chicago, a wealthy man uh, who actually built an observatory for his son uh, in the 1870s and 80s. After George Ellery Hale became uh, an adult, he ultimately arranged for the funding of the large Yerkes Observatory and then went out west to Pasadena and became aware of the truly remarkable uh, clarity of the skies and the uh, dependability of the atmosphere in the area near Pasadena, near Mount Wilson. And as a consequence, he decided to see if he could put uh, telescopes near the mountain area, not on top summit, wherever it would be flat enough to do so. And of course, in those days, the roads and the weather and all the rest was a pretty high adventure to get up there. Um, and so he first arranged for the building of the 55 uh, foot, 60 inch telescope, the one you see in the picture. And following that was the 100-inch Hooker telescope. Now, before you ask, the name Hooker was the name of the man who paid for it. And these, of course, are mirror-based telescopes because the lenses become hard to retain the shape after about a meter in diameter. And so this led now to telescopes of diameters that were truly remarkable compared to the other parts of the world. That being said, these were mechanical telescopes and so the ability of these to track the stars with great precision it was still limited it was still a kind of a dead reckoning kind of situation you can make the mounting and the drive systems as precise as you want to but when you need precision of around an arc second or less which is less than one three thousand six hundredth of a degree the mechanical systems on their own are not adequate and so what we had to do in those days and what we did in amateur astronomy right up to the 1990s was to guide the images uh, that we were taking of the night sky by hand and you can see an example of this in the lower left picture so Wendell Hogg uh, night assistant this is on the same telescope uh, it's, this is take, of course, in the daytime, otherwise you'd never see him. It'd be as dark as possible to not affect the images. Uh, the telescope itself is um, in front of him, and you'll notice that he's actually looking through a different telescope. And this is what we call a guide scope. So the main telescope will have a camera. Uh, the image plate is probably located right at the back of the telescope and he has put that in <clears throat> everything's dark and he's all set up then he will pull out a plate that will expose the glass plate to the night sky and then he will watch through the guide scope 
um, a star or something that's nearby to the area that we're imaging. And they're in that guide scope will be a crosshairs of some kind that's illum illuminated. And then he will, with the hand controller he has in his left hand, make micro adjustments to the telescope's position to maintain the star within that um, little zone. Now the magnification of the guide scope is probably 10, maybe even 100 times greater than what the telescope itself is doing. And so this then leads to uh, an image which is almost perfect. And these images often took hours, depending on what you were trying to do. As I said before, the plate sensitivity, especially in those days, was less than 1% of all photons. And so it was a cold, lonely job. And you could see him in his buffalo coat here. Uh, you're sitting on the top of a mountain, so the temperatures are getting down, you know, near freezing. Uh, and you're sitting there for hours. You can't move, really. Uh, you can't go to the bathroom. You can't do very much at all. And so you get cold. And um, so the favorite drink of astronomers was coffee in a thermos. It was uh, a warming type of drink for that purpose. The plates were generally developed at the observatory proper instead of bringing them down the mountain and potentially breaking them or exposing them to light. And so almost all observatories had their own dark room where the plates would be developed pretty much right away. You also have to develop the plates fairly soon after they've been exposed or there's other chemical reactions that occur as well. So in the days of the mechanical telescopes, we would assume uh, that you, when a, a youngster looks at this, you would assume that you would simply move the telescope up and down and left and right and follow the objects in the sky. But of course, the objects in the sky don't follow directions like that. They follow an arc, which is a function of the Earth's rotation and our location on the Earth, our latitude. So as a consequence, uh, to make the guiding systems easier, they made one axis parallel to the Earth's rotational axis. And then the second one was separate from it. So if you look, for example, in the left lower left image here, you'll see that the horseshoe, the uh, line, looks goes off on an angle. And this angle is then parallel to the Earth's rotational axis. So the um, moving the telescope to the, if you will, to the left or the right is what we call declination. And that can be set for a given object. And then when that's set, uh, if you rotate in this uh, angled axis, you're going to be rotating in the same uh, plane, the same direction that the Earth rotates. So all we do then is have the system rotate in the direction opposite the Earth's rotation, and that offsets the Earth's rotation, and then the telescope will remain pointed at the star for as long as you want it to. Uh, so this was giving us a very precise setup, and these were all designs you can see with great care. Now, this still doesn't obviate the need for hand guiding for images, but it sure makes it a lot easier. If you use an up, up down, left, right, or what we call altitude azimuth mount system, uh, you need to guide in both axes, which is exceedingly complicated before computers, and the image actually rotates in the view. So you have to have all of that considered if you're going to do it in this other simple way. And at that time, it just wasn't possible. One of the other problems, as you can see in the upper right here with the 100 inch, is that the telescope is on the near a mountaintop, but there are trees growing there. And so you have to build the pier up high enough that the telescope can see well clear of all that. Uh, secondly, notice that most of the dome is completely empty, allowing for the telescope to slew around as it needs to. And of course, the dome will have to rotate as well to accommodate the opening of the slit. This made the domes very large compared to the telescope that was in. Of course, that makes them more expensive. So we see here the kind of the basic story of the building of the 200-inch telescope at Mount Palomar. And the upper left is a concrete model of the mirror. Uh, so you can see the size of the 5-meter mirror compared to the tourists. The mirror was cast at the Corning Works in New York City, or New York State, pardon me, in southern New York State. And they were some of the finest opticians at that time in America. And of course, you have to appreciate that 
opticians, if they weren't working on the big mirror, they were unemployed. Uh, this was the Great Depression, and this was real trouble. Uh, Edwin Hubble had discovered in 1928-29 that the universe was expanding, and this was such a profound discovery. It was clear uh, that the 100-inch had been used to its extent and that a new telescope was necessary that was bigger, that would look deeper into the universe to see if his discovery, in fact, was valid and, and extend that discovery. George Ellery Hale was able to secure funding through the Carnegie Institute, and the great man himself was still available at that time. And um, so the mirror was cast at Corning. The first casting was a disaster. The second one went very well. And then the mirror had to be moved, the blank, to Pasadena for the grinding and polishing process. And this had to go across America uh, by rail. And uh, the mirror being 17 feet odd in diameter, meant that to put it on a rail car, it had to be a special arrangement. The rail car had to be built with a slow slung center and smaller wheels, and the mirror had to be canted slightly so that it could get in through the tunnels and other obstacles and bridges and so forth as the train went across America. There was also three inch steel plates put on either side to prevent someone from taking a pot shot at it with a rifle. By the time it got to Pasadena, they began the polishing process, but World War II intervened and the mirror was put in storage for four years. In 1946 it was taken out, the polishing process was finished, and in 1948 we had the opening ceremonies. And you can see the, the event on the lower left with uh, all the spectators in the observatory building proper uh, underneath the amazing uh, stresses of the telescope itself. Today on the right hand side, lower right, you see a more modern picture of the telescope as it is today. And that large horseshoe um, bearing that you see in the upper left, if you will, uh, the whole telescope weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 tons. And so they couldn't use ball bearings because they would flatten over time by the simple weight of the telescope. So instead they use high pressure oil uh, to allow it to move um, along that axis without friction. And this is probably the finest telescope from the standpoint of handcrafting mechanical work we'll ever get. Today the telescopes are made well, but they're, they're maintained, their motion sort of is controlled by a computer, so you don't have the same reliance on mechanical precision. Now, we have a final picture here of uh, the telescope itself and the great man Edwin Hubble uh, sitting in the secondary mirror of the telescope, something you wouldn't do normally. Uh, but uh, the telescope is so much bigger than telescopes of the past. As you can look down, you see the large 17 uh, foot diameter mirror. Uh, there's a the black ring, it's hard to see there, but actually will cover the mirror when it's not in use. Uh, you can take pictures uh, from the location where Hubble is. These are what we call prime focus images, where we're just using the telescope as a really big uh, lens on a camera. Uh, but uh, my suspicion he was put uh, in this position to take a picture probably from the observatory roof uh, uh, during the opening uh, events given that it was his research that made the telescope's building necessary. So prior to World War II and so on, you had a handful of distinguished observers that generally worked alone. The Tweed suited professor, if you will. On the left is a German expatriate named Walter Botta, who was one of the finest technical observers in history, as far as I'm concerned, one of my favorite scientists and um, he was a true expert at the 100 inch telescope uh, he was mastered you know changing the ventilation in the observatory to change the uh, how the focus of the telescope would change with the temperature change and he would adjust the focus based on a plan he had ahead of time and this would lead to clearer images remarkable fellow and just as an aside since he's here in this picture in World War II, because he was uh, still a German citizen, even though he wasn't a Nazi, uh, he was uh, in the United States. He wasn't interned, but he wasn't obviously trusted with defense uh, contracts, and so he was basically sitting at home. And there was a curfew that he had to be at home between uh, 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. in the morning. And, uh, of course, you have the 100-inch telescope um, sitting on the mountaintop with no one using it because all the other observers are busy with war work, including Hubble himself, who was at Aberdeen trying to make artillery shells go further. 
And so as a consequence, um, Adams, who was the observatory director, appealed to, to the uh, authorities and said, listen, you have one of the finest observers here with nothing to do. Uh, he's, uh, could we not relax the restrictions so that he could go to the telescope and at least do some research? And they agreed. And Walter Botta, in one, another happy accident of the time, we have one of the finest technical observers, and at that time, the best telescope in the world uh, with unrestricted access to it. And what he found over time was that there was two distinct populations of stars, stars that are basically made entirely of hydrogen and helium and stars that have a lot of other impurities. Now, astronomers don't worry about subtleties of molecules very often because the stars are too hot. So anything heavier than helium is generally called a metal. And so stars like our sun have all kinds of impurities. Uh, and those metals, of course, are also part of the solar system, which is why we're here. But uh, older stars, before uh, these metals formed, of course, are metal poor. And Hubble, uh, sorry, Bada was able to find this separate population. And what in an exciting extent to this, uh, when Bada basically retired in 1956, uh, he found uh, that the Cepheid stars that Hubble was using to find the distance to the nearest galaxies, he found that uh, that the Cepheid stars in the different populations behave differently and made a difference in the distance measurements by a factor of 1.5. And he did not tell anybody in advance and announced this uh, with great um, surprise uh, at a conference in 1956 as he retired. And Walter Botta died in 1960, uh, in my view, due to a botched operation on his back. But what is interesting is that 1960-odd is, a, is a, an interesting year uh, in astronomy because here you have the first real end of the sense of cosmology and, the, and we thought we understood a whole bunch of things and if we just got better telescopes, we'd understand them a little better. And here we are, 2020. And we've lost, you know, 96% of the universe through dark matter and dark energy and other things that uh, at that time were just, you know, dark energy didn't exist. Dark matter was kind of lurking there. Ambada had participated in some of the research, but it hadn't been defined. And so it's just kind of an interesting line in the sand. Um, on the right, you see, of course, uh, Edwin Hubble, uh, who had been born in uh, the Midwest United States, but he was very capable. He ended up as a Rhodes Scholar and really maintained sort of English manners thereafter. Um, Hubble had um, first shown the Cepheid relationship that showed that the universe was much bigger than just one galaxy. Uh, as they like to say, after his paper was published, the universe expanded a thousand times in one evening. Um, that was, of course, the human perception of it, not, not anything physical. And then, of course, later on, extending his work to show that the universe itself was expanding, something that Einstein had predicted in his research in 1916, but decided to shy away from it because at that time, the research did not suggest it. Hubble always had his pipe. Professors generally smoked pipes. They were considered more academic, more elegant than raw mean cigarettes or something as base as a cigar. Um, and um, so anyhow, it was a, a very individual kind of world. You had maybe 20 or 30 members of the Mount Wilson Observing Group who were also professors probably at Caltech uh, most of the time, not all the time, but certainly Hubble was. Um, Hubble had a night assistant named Milton Humason, who himself became a very prolific observer. And an interesting twist of history, uh, Humason had originally been what they call a mule skinner, which was someone who drove the mules up the hill to carry the parts of the telescope, uh, the first 100 inch at the turn of the century. He became very interested in the work they were doing and he was able to get hired on as basically like the maintenance man. And uh, obviously very interested in equipment and so forth. <clears throat> he um, uh, became, Hubble hired him ultimately to begin to take images of the telescope, which put a lot of noses out of joint because Humason wasn't an educated man in the sense of university education, but he could make the telescope do what it had to do. Uh, now, Hubble notoriously was uh, a very vain individual and certainly always wanted to put people in their place. And so Humason was a good choice for him because he wasn't competition. Uh, and Humason always was deferential to Hubble, which is just how it had to be. Uh, Hubble took many extended vacations and drove the observatory director Adams to distraction uh, over uh, some of his successes, uh, basically trading on, on his previous successes. Abada had no, no such illusions and uh, was far more dependable when it came to that. Uh, I think that um, 
what is it just for me at least being more of an individualist i think that i'm the romance of these days is, is far more appealing to me than the big uh, projects of today in 1931 uh, albert einstein made a pilgrimage to mount wilson in a sense to recognize the work of edwin uh hubble uh in showing that the original prediction that Einstein's equations had yielded in 1916 that the universe was in fact expanding was not really um, what was in fact true and Einstein had not had the courage of his convictions at the time and he always called that his greatest mistake he doesn't mean it's a simple algebraic mistake what he meant was is that his equations predicted this new phenomenon of the universe and he didn't trust himself enough to, to, to stick with it and Hubble later showed that it was to be true and you can see in this picture, we won't get into all the folks here, uh, but uh, <clears throat> a couple of interesting people uh, I've mentioned. Uh, so Humason, so to the extreme left, then Hubble, and then the fourth one over is Adams, who was the director of the Mount Wilson Observatory, and this is in the library here. And you see, of course, the oil portrait of George Ellery Hale, the man who made it all happen. So as the century, sort of as the war ended, things changed. So the education acts and opportunities for people to get more education after World War II, uh, certainly by the 1960s, a great number of people in comparison had professorial type degrees and research was becoming now done by large groups of people. And you can see in the lower right picture, uh, an example of a collaboration. Uh, oftentimes uh, papers now, not always, but sometimes are written by hundreds of people, especially if it's an observationally type based type uh, project. Uh, theoretical work sometimes is done by fewer. But nevertheless, the other point that was made to me is that the pace is much faster. And this is quite stressful because the science and the questions that they're asked are often very involved. So I was talking to John Bachal one time, who was one of the fathers of the Space Telescope. And he said to me that in the old days, you would get an, a letter in the mail that would explain the question and you'd have maybe a week to think about it and come up with an intelligent reply and mail this back. And that, and that was, you know, seemed reasonable. And today, of course, you get an email in the morning and by the afternoon, somebody wants the answer. And uh, this can be quite difficult. But the tweed suited professor uh, of, of history and of my uh, romance, so to speak, is uh, working alone is pretty much archaic now, and those days are long over with. So this is a good example of the frustrations that can come about. I guess you could say uh, you have um, Professor Alan Sandage, who was one of Walter Botta's uh, uh, students, and he worked with other people too in the late 40s and early 50s. And Alan Sanders, of course, graduated around the time when the 200 inch got his PhD roughly when the 200 inch first came online. So he was ready to go and he was a consummate observer, one of the best. Um, this particular telescope had made it and really limited by 1961, two, three or four had basically said, this is the limit of what the cosmological information we can take with this telescope. Now with some incremental improvement to equipment, we could do a little better later on. Uh, but just a categorically brilliant observer and and the telescope after a few years he had done everything you could do with it and in his life there were no new telescopes of consequence until he was in comparison an older man the the massive changes to telescope construction in the 1980s and beyond uh, by then Alan Sanders was 60. now I'm not saying he couldn't enjoy this and be part and contribute of course he did uh, but you'll see if you look in history that uh, the new ideas and the brunt scars are made by young people. That's just the way the world goes. What's amazing about the changes that began in the 1980s was that we didn't just change one aspect of how telescopes were built or how they were used. We literally changed every aspect. And so the improvement in ability to observe and, and delineate science and so forth came from every direction and was magnified literally by that, which is just one of those remarkable things in history. Let's look first at, at the imaging system itself. We've been using chemical films for a long time. 
Uh, now we have the invention of the electronic imager, which was done in the mid 1970s. And of course, these things take time to become available. Exceptionally sensitive. So those of you familiar with film, we had like 100, 400 film. In comparison, this is like 100,000 film. And because it's very sensitive, it can take pictures very quickly. And so you can take a lot more pictures as well. And that'll also allow us to do other things. Uh, these chips take a little, very little electricity, so you do not have enormous demands on your remote observatory. These are, of course, digital images, and we can do image processing with them. They're also linear, so if we take a picture and we take the, the time, we, the exposure time is twice as long, we get twice as much brightness. If you use photographic film, you have a chemical reaction called reciprocity failure, which makes that very difficult. Uh, these the particular uh, chips, the chemistry of them is such that you get infrared sensitivity and red sensitivities, which is almost impossible with photographic plates. We had more challenge trying to see in the blue with the, this technology. Now, photoelectric materials were known back in the 1850s, uh, selenium and so forth. But to turn it into this device took until about 1970. And Boyle and Smith at the truly famous Bell Labs wrote a paper about how this could be done. In 1974, the first array was actually uh, operational as a test device. By the 1980s, uh, people were buying Sony camcorders from the store to take pictures of uh, little Susie's birthday party. And so things completely changed. In the 60s and 70s, you, had, you made family movies uh, on movie film, and the movie lasted three minutes. And... Uh, those were like 20 bucks a piece. So you might go for a two weeks vacation to Europe and shoot three movies, uh, maybe three or four. And that was, that was enough money spent on that kind of thing. So the idea today of having, you know, literally hours, days of video about different things was just foreign to uh, the concept of the time. Earlier, I mentioned this issue of reciprocity failure. So let's have just a bit of a look at it because those of you with digital cameras have no familiarization with it. The chemical film, uh, when it was exposed to light, uh, responded very quickly at the beginning. And then as, you, as the exposure went longer, uh, the film became less and less sensitive. And this meant that if we wanted to take longer images, which we do, of course, when the objects are very dim, then the length of the exposure was far greater than it would justify for the amount of exposure we needed. Now, if you look at this particular graph and you see the blue line here that goes across and you can see it goes to 3,600 seconds along the uh, x-axis, that is uh, so one hour image. And you can go across to the y-axis and you'll see that it is also roughly 3,600 seconds or one hour. So in other words, an hour of exposure with a digital image CCD type device uh, is uh, going to give you an hour's uh, worth of exposure. But the chemical film became increasingly less sensitive and you can follow the red line here now. So let's just have a quick look here. If we wanted a, a thousand second exposure, we would have to expose that film for say something like 12,000 seconds. Uh, if we wanted a 2,000 uh, second image, we might have to expose it for 25,000 or so forth. And right up to this day-long image here, which, like I said, was 3,600 seconds, one hour on a di digital device, if we extrapolate this up, uh, would be in the neighborhood of 45-odd thousand seconds or over half a day. Uh, and so the ability to take long-duration dim images was enhanced not only due to the sensitivity of the camera itself, but also the fact that the camera was not affected by this attenuation due to the chemistry of the film. So we have then the really big uh, change that made all of what I have been talking about and will continue to talk about possible, and this was the invention of the desktop or microcomputer. You know, in the 1960s, a computer would fill a room and take a substantial amount of electrical power, and suddenly now they're sitting on top of a desk and are with, with pretty significant capabilities. Now, there was, an, as often as the case with new technologies, there was a few 
trial balloons that were uh, out in the consumer market. And uh, remember that these machines in those days were what I like to call nerd machines. They did have, there was no software. There was very little in the way of games. There was no internet. There was, un until the beginning of the 80s, there were really no computer stores. And so you bought these computers at, you know, Macy's or Eaton's or something. And you went home and you turned it on and it said ready. And if it was going to do anything, you had to write your own programs. And so I think that the major computer, computer manufacturers that build larger computers just felt that the general population couldn't be interested in such a serious mathematical, technical type hobby. However, um, these uh, smaller computers started to sell. Uh, if you look at the one in the lower right corner, the Commodore PET 2001, uh, I bought one of those in 1978. It was the first person in the history of my high school to own a computer. And you can see the small keyboard and the tape player. There is no disk drives or anything like that. They didn't exist at the time. If you wanted to save your program, you put in a very high quality cassette and it took upwards of two minutes to save a fairly long program. Uh, you had 7,167 bytes of memory, and this is uh, sounds ridiculously small. We have icons that are that big now, but you have to understand a few basics about how these computers were designed. There was no pixel graphics. There was no mouse. You have, there was no color screen, and the characters were all capitals, and they were all therefore in a ROM, 40 characters across, 25 characters down, uh, rows if you will. And so when you wrote a program in line numbered basic a lot of the behind the scenes type action that is takes up so much memory today was already taken care of and with a four megahertz clock you could still do a fair bit with these machines and so we used this a great deal and wrote all kinds of very interesting programs and I really got to enjoy this device a great deal uh, the another one at the time was the Radio Shack computer. It had more memory, uh, but I uh, didn't like the keyboard, and the editing thing was a little bit convoluted as well. And I just kind of liked the style of the other one, and was uh, never really regretted it. It uh, worked very well. Uh, notice also there was no printer, and uh, these computers did well enough that uh, there were versions two and three and so forth into the early 80s. However. The IBM PC that you can see on the left that came about in 1980 kind of established the market. As you can see, it has a substantially greater amount of memory than the other computers. It has the floppy drives and so on. So this was a step ahead, and I think this was the idea of IBM to corner the computer market for the uh, consumer. But these computers were fairly expensive, and it was hardly gotten started, and people were manufacturers were taking these things apart and building basically computers that were uh, identical in, in operation that cost only half as much. And they were at that time called clones. And of course, people bought the clones. And so IBM, even though they kind of invented the desktop computer, hardly made any of them at all. And in the upper right, you see starting MS-DOS. Well, the operating system for this computer was written by this little tiny company up in Seattle known as Microsoft. And they got their start uh, hand in hand with IBM because every IBM computer that was sold uh, was sold with their operating system and they made um, their their money off of that as well. So mirror making was transformed by the invention of the microcomputer. So in the upper left you see the old system of making mirrors where you have a, a system of gears and equipment and those uh, machines can be adjusted as you can see by different wheels and levers and sitting on the chair is a highly skilled optician who's keeping an eye on the process. It is a black art and no two mirrors would ever be quite the same. So it would be very difficult, for example, to make a telescope that would have two mirrors in it because to make the two of them the same would make that, would be pretty much difficult. We call the uh, shaping of a mirror when it's finished, and we call that shape its figure. And um, the way we make a mirror like that, you can see the pad 
and that'll be spinning. And there's this black, this gray stuff you see there. That is a, a, a grit, a fine grit of sand. And as this thing spins, it erodes part of the, the glass. And we do this in a very careful way to get the shape of the mirror we're interested in. If we move now ahead to the current times, it's a different situation entirely. The mirror shape is completely controlled by a computer. So you can see over here in the left corner, there's the technician with the computer system, which is all controlled by the polishing equipment here. And so although he, I'm sure, understands basic optics about the mirror, he's primarily making sure <clears throat> that the computer does what it's supposed to do. And so, but we're still using grit, but you can see the polishing head has all kinds of different uh, sources on it. It may even have sources of grit on here too that can be dispensed as it goes. Whichever way, we now can make a mirror exactly the shape and figure we want within the tolerance. And this also allows us to make more than one mirror uh, that are more or less identical. The structures of telescope mirrors changed significantly over this time as well. <clears throat> In the upper right, you see the general old-fashioned way of doing things, which is a very thick mirror. You can see, in this case, probably almost two feet thick. And in this example, which I believe to be the polymer mirror, you're looking at maybe the 17 feet across. This mirror weighs 30 or 40 tons. It's enormous. And you see those blocks inside it. Those are openings and open areas to create a honeycomb structure inside to allow air to, f to move around inside the mirror so that when the mirror cools and during the evening it will cool comparatively uh, even across the mirror itself and you get less effects. If the mirror itself is sensitive to temperature then different parts of the mirror will expand and contract at different rates. And this will distort the shape of the glass and of course distort the images. In 1982-83, the European Southern Observatory at La Silla in Chile um, decided to uh, throw out all these old ideas and build what they called the New Technology Telescope. And you can see the mirror for that in its cell here in the upper left corner. And uh, this is a much thinner mirror pers perspective. It's about six to eight inches thick, if, if that even. And so the mirror is held in its shape by computer actuators behind it. So as the telescope moves this way and that, uh, these actuators and the computer itself make sure that the mirror maintains a perfect shape. And so at the same time, we went away from the equatorial mount, went to the alt as mount, control both axes with a computer, control a field derotator and the secondary mirror, and all the rest of it. This was the first telescope you could not look through with an eyepiece. It's all done through digital and there was no dark room in the observatory. So all of the old ideas went out the window and we had this brand new way of doing things. This telescope <clears throat> off the top of my head is I think around three meters across. So it's a substantial telescope but not as big as the other ones to keep the cost reasonable and the techniques reasonable but still big enough that they could be properly evaluated. It's been found that beyond about eight meters, it's better to make mirrors in pieces. And telescopes constructed in this manner are called segmented optics. The first example of this was the Keck telescopes in Hawaii that are more or less 10 meters in diameter. So they milled these hexagonal mirrors. And they put them together with the center one missing. And you fit them together very precisely and each, one, each mirror is made to a specific prescription. And, uh, and then you can build an, an aperture pretty much as big as you want to make it. And so this is uh, done. And again, each of these pieces is held in place by a computer. So it allows us to have a much bigger telescope, but at the same time, a telescope that is in comparison, not as heavy as it would otherwise be. One of the challenges we face in all of these upscaling things is the old adage of twice as big, which is fine, four times as strong, because strength is a function of area, which sounds good. Uh, but the problem is the mass increases by the volume. So twice as big, four times as strong, but eight times as heavy. So very really quickly, the mass catches up to you and the strength increase is not enough and you get limitations. And so the only way to get past this is to come up with very clever structures and devices 
that uh, can be made large but not have a, such an increase in mass. One of the more remarkable changes that has been made to astronomy and telescopes has been how the mirrors themselves are actually made. So originally you would have a mirror that would be cast as a large disc of glass that would be flat across and this would take however long to to form it fairly quickly probably in a few days and then an hour about a year uh, to very very slowly cool it because if you cool it <clears throat> too quickly you'll have hot areas and cool areas and you'll almost for sure get a crack so it takes about a year <clears throat> and this whole process is called annealing and uh, this then you start the grinding process so in the case of the polymer mirror, which is you know 17 feet across, they might have had to take almost a foot of glass out of the center. So this takes a long time. <clears throat> you can make mistakes, and if you are too aggressive, you can of course damage the blank. So the new idea that they have now is to simply take the uh, blank, the glass pieces you can see in the lower image here, and put them into the amount necessary, and then drop the lid down, close it up, turn on the heat, and now the mirror starts to spin and when you do this and the glass gets to an appropriate temperature the glass will dish out and if you've got the proper rotation rate you can arrange for the glass to be in the uh, the right shape almost due to simply by centripetal forces and then you'll turn the heat off if after you're satisfied uh, and then the mirror will continue to spin as it cools over the next year. But when you're finished, then when the mirror blank comes out, it's almost the shape that you want, and all we have to do now is polish. So this makes the mirrors uh, manufacturing uh, quicker, and the polishing process now is more to the specific figure you're looking for. So this is a wonderful innovation to mirror making. And so in addition to all the manufacturing techniques, we have the actual glass itself. And so regular plate glass that you might find in windows and so forth, it expands with temperature. And this changes the shape, which is unacceptable. Now, you know this already in your chemistry class, you have to use a special type of glass in your uh, glassware or you'll have breakage, which we call Pyrex. And this is because you can heat it and it doesn't expand and that causes the glass not to shatter. And so Pyrex is simply, that's just a brand name for what we call fused quartz glass. It's pretty hard to work with actually when it comes to the standpoint of polishing the lenses, it, it chips and so forth. We move beyond this, of course, to uh, other types of lower expansion glass. Uh, the current ones are borosilicate and so on. And I'm sure there's new ones coming along as we go. Now we used to coat with silver uh, and that's very reflective, almost 95%. Uh, but this tarnishes quickly, which is a pain, and so usually it's aluminum, perhaps with other coatings on it, which is much more durable, and arguably is a, you know close to being about 90% odd reflective. Most of the mirrors in your bathrooms are all aluminum, and uh, this recoating, of course, has to be redone every once in a while, depending on the observatory and the telescope, perhaps every two years or so. Uh, at the observatory, you're not going to bring the mirror down the hill uh, to have it fixed. It's got to be done on the hill. Now what happens is they're going to remove the mirror from the cell and usually drop it down into the basement of the observatory where they have a workshop. Now here the mirror will have its coating completely removed using acid. And so all you have left now is the glass. And then they turn around and put it inside a uh, bell uh, jar, which reduces the air pressure to zero practically. And then you mist in uh, aluminum uh, and this will cover the mirror uniformly and give you a new coat, a new uh, surface, and perhaps uh, coatings if that's what they wanted to do. When you do it this way, this prevents air from lying between the aluminum and the mirror, uh, and this uh, makes the uh, coating much more effective. Uh, the recoated mirror is put back in the observatory. Uh, you have to uh, recalibrate everything as, as well. So the observatory locations were also a factor. 
uh, you are dealing with uh, initially, as I said earlier, uh, observatories fairly close to the universities because of the difficulty of travel. And then ultimately we've got to mountaintops uh, and uh, into more remote sites, uh, air travel and driving and internet and so forth. And so you see here some of the more famous sites in the upper left corner, of course, is the Harvard College Observatory uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, the buildings in the back are the ones that still exist. The ones in the front ground are gone now. Uh, on the right, upper right, you have, of course, the magnificent Mount Palomar Dome, which we saw earlier. Uh, and then uh, La Sila in, uh, La, in Las Campanas, uh, Chilean desert, where depending on who you talk to, it hasn't rained in, you know, something like uh, um, 10 years or whatever. But also, of course, much most interesting is it gives us a view of the southern sky and then towards the center of the galaxy. But you also have a significant altitude there of almost 8,000 feet in the Andes Mountains, which gives the astronomers less air they have to look through. Um, of course, the uh, current uh, site of uh, greatest interest is in Hawaii on the Big Island of the uh, Mauna Kea Observatory. And here you have telescopes scattered all over the summit, uh, different sorts. And uh, of course, what's happening here is that you're now 13,800 feet above sea level, which is now working with a 60% atmosphere. So it's really, uh, you know, difficult almost for the observers. Um, they are not allowed to sleep here. They come up for the night's viewing and then back down in the morning to 5,000 feet uh, to their uh, facility. And uh, now, there have been more recent controversies. Uh, the natives uh, find this site uh, sacred, and so there's been controversies about how many telescopes can be there and all the rest, and this has been one of those challenges. And this is what happens, um, clashes of culture, and it's, you know, uh, we can say, oh my goodness, but the point is that the site and their spiritual beliefs is just as important to them as any research is to us. So it's hard to work these things out sometimes. So the second generation of computer contribution here, of course, is that of the Internet. Now, in the 1980s, there was a certain amount of computer networking done through the universities, but certainly not um, on the scale of what we have today. Uh, when I attended the university in 1992, it wasn't until 94 that even undergrads could access the Internet uh, at the university facilities. But as we move towards the end of the century, the ability to rem observe uh, remotely is now a real thing. Uh, the telescopes have, there are many of them, they all have specific instruments. So depending on the observation that you are intending to make, uh, you can decide, okay, well, I would request observing time on this telescope or that one, assuming that your university has an affiliation. <clears throat> and then, uh, when you make that a run, you, of course, you're online perhaps uh, or not or ahead of time or something. And you'll say, OK, I want this uh, this the instrument with this filter and what have you. And then there are the people at the telescope, the technicians, the lead of whom is called a telescope operator, uh, will actually um, set it up so that that instrument is used. <clears throat> and they will track the object, make sure things are working the way they're supposed to and then you will have access to the image. Um, typical rules would be that you have the image for one year before it's made public. Now that'll depend on the funding of the university. Uh, the Hubble's are, my, are embargoed for one year and then they're public domain because the telescope is primarily paid for by the taxpayer. So you get a little bit of time to do your work. And telescope operators have a primary responsibility, which is to take care of the telescope and not have it become uh, damaged, that its maintenance is well maintained, because these telescopes are intended to last for decades, if not centuries. And uh, <clears throat> there uh, have been stories where telescope operators allowed the observation to continue when it was, say, high wind and there was dust being blown, or even in one case where rain was coming into the uh, dome while uh, out over the horizon, the object was still visible. Uh, these are things that are not, uh, could lead to discipline, of course. But the main point here is that back, compared to the days of Wendell Hogue in 1912, 
These are very complex instruments, and a professor is only going to be on them maybe five, six, seven, eight, ten days a year. There's no way they're going to remember how all this works. And so it's a very good chance that they might break it. And a, a professor who is very theoretical may not be very practical mechanically either. So you have these skilled operators whose job is to simply run the telescope, and the professor is the one who says what to look at and how to observe. So it's another development to this process, but what it does do is it saves a tremendous amount of money of travel time and of, of professors being away from the university. So there's a lot of uh, advantages with remote observing. So another aspect that we get with the new technology is the ability to enhance the images that we get from the telescope or any other device. In the days of chemical film, <clears throat> when you take it off, off the camera, you're going to uh, combine it with other chemicals that will basically freeze and make chemically stable the image that you've recorded on the film. And this is what we call developing. Uh, customarily, the film would be sent away to a laboratory that would do this, and you'd have to pay a few dollars for this to happen. <clears throat> that would give you a strip of negatives, and then from there, they could print pictures, and you can see the enlarging device here on the left side that would be used to print this. And of course, all this has to be done in the dark, and it's a fairly tricky business. Tremendous amounts of water are used to rinse the film, uh, so it was all a very... Uh, uh, process. But the, regardless of that, the main point here is that you cannot change the image after it's been developed. So if there's a mistake in the uh, taking of the picture, there was some jiggling or something, you don't always know that happened. Uh, it can even just be the wind uh, that has moved the telescope a little bit uh, that you missed, uh, causing some vibrations. And so, And furthermore, even if you have a fine image, you cannot use other technologies to make enhance that image further. Whereas with image processing, with digital images, they are just numbers. And so we can use all kinds of mathematics to enhance how these numbers are distributed in this grid. And then that would reestablish the image in far better detail, a sharpness, and so on. We can also use things like false color to enhance differences, etc. All things that are more or less impossible with respect to uh, chemical processing. And we're going to talk more about image processing later, but it is certainly a big factor in digital imaging. So the benefits that the professionals have noticed uh, over the last uh, few decades have not been lost on the amateurs. And certainly since the mid-90s and beyond, the amateurs have had a chance to purchase some very finely uh, made equipment and telescopes larger and far more complex than ever before. So this allows for interested amateurs around the world to view the night sky, to do citizen research, to take all kinds of very interesting images and otherwise enjoy this hobby. And you see, and very commonly, uh, they build their own observatories. And by building the observatory, the telescope equipment is ready for use uh, in a few minutes because it's already set up on its mounting. And again, if the telescopes are fairly substantial, it's really not practical to move it out every time from storage. Uh, the top two, you can see the standard type of observatory used by most amateurs is a roll-off shed. Uh, what this does is allows us first to build an, in a fairly straightforward square rectangular way. Secondly, the entire roof rolls off so you get a chance to see the entire night sky. And this makes the observatory less complicated uh, and you can put your money then into your equipment and so on. So the, for the top two are European observers and you're looking at twenty dollars to $50,000 worth of equipment depending on what else they have there. Um, they will all have computers at the telescope. These telescopes are all go-to telescopes, so on the computer screen you can click on an object. The telescope will take you there and be pretty close to being right on. And then when you're actually taking the image, this telescope will self-guide itself on the image and you don't have to do anything. In fact, you can even program uh, the software connected to these telescopes for a type of an observing run for the evening and you go in and go to bed and let the telescope uh, do its work, and in the morning you get the images that have been made over the nighttime. 
Uh, the bottom two images are my own personal observatory. Uh, the right, you see the building closed up. And on the left, you see the roof off and my telescope coming out the top. You have also seen this structure in the previous video. <clears throat> and uh, But just to give you an idea of the opportunities that it gives, this my particular one is 8 feet square, so it's with just like a garden shed in size, but it's more than adequate for one observer. So this uh, next few panels is to simply give you some comparison upon what the uh, progress that's been made. And I thought I'd compare amateur to professional, which is a very unfair thing to do, but that's why I'm doing it. So here we have first an image of the planet Neptune taken by the spacecraft Voyager 2 in 1989 at the end, early September uh, of its encounter. This is the only spacecraft ever to visit Neptune, and you can see in the lower left Neptune with some weather features on it and its uh, moon Triton off in the distance. And this was, now of course the spacecraft got much closer and got way better detail, but this is kind of the setting that I have for this one. Now let's have a look and see what uh, current amateurs are doing in the same situation. We can see here that uh, an amateur astronomer taking an image today who knows what he's doing in 19, 2015, probably could be a little better today, with a comparatively modest telescope. I mean, this is, you know, with what's there, maybe $10,000 or so, something like that. It's not... Uh, a lot of money given what other people do for hobbies. And you can see that uh, there are weather features on Neptune. It's not quite as sharp as Voyager, but considering that this is in the neighborhood of 3 billion kilometers away, it's a pretty amazing image to be taken by such a modest instrument. So one of the more profound objects in the night sky, is, but even for amateurs, is the planet Saturn. It doesn't take more than 50 or 100 power in a small telescope to reveal the rings and they give the planet a very three-dimensional effect which is quite striking. The first uh, spacecraft to visit Saturn was Pioneer 11 back in the early 1970s uh, but these spacecraft were not had did not have extensive equipment it was and they were damaged by the radiation near Jupiter so the first really good look we had at Saturn was the Voyager series of spacecraft that arrived at Saturn in 1980. The first one, Voyager 1, uh, went first to Jupiter, of course, and then on to Saturn, and then was in effect ejected from the solar system. Voyager 2 followed a similar track, but then was able to continue on to Uranus and finally Neptune. So here we see the Voyager 1 image, and you can see left of center, uh, there's a bit of a storm going on there. Some very interesting detail in the Saturn. Also, I draw your attention to the upper left on the rings. You'll see some uh, dust sitting above the rings, which they call spokes, which was a discovery that no one had anticipated prior. Okay, well, let's flip this now to what an amateur might be doing uh, today, say 35 years later. We see an image like this one <clears throat> taken perhaps in 2015, 2017, as you see there. And uh, there's coloration of the planet, and just by the inclination that we do see it now, there's actually a view of the South Pole, which is quite remarkable. And you can see the hexagonal uh, cloud pattern at the base. Doesn't quite pick up the spokes, if there are any, but you can see, if you look carefully in Cassini's division, you can actually see the planet through the division, which is pretty amazing. So this, again, taken by an amateur telescope, somewhere between 40 and 80 centimeters in diameter, uh, compared to uh, billions of dollars of space probe. The one that's amazing is the planet Mars. This is the planet Mars taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, a $3 billion instrument. This is taken, uh, Mars is about twice as big as the moon. And uh, this is, but of course, it's at a distance of 50 to 75 million kilometers when these pictures are taken, a long way from home. All right, let's have a look at what the amateurs are up to here. And it's not quite as sharp, uh, understandably, uh, but still a truly spectacular image taken by a telescope similar to the one you saw earlier. And, uh, and we get ourselves these amazing, amazing images. And remember, if you don't have a space probe around a planet, 
Uh, the only thing we have to keep an eye on what's going on with its weather or whatever are these images. The professional astronomers most of the time are not the least bit interested in the planets. They're observing uh, galaxies and other things and uh, have a list of uh, observations they want to make and they couldn't care less about the, the weather on the planet Mars, for example. So it's not the first time that some of these things are discovered by amateurs because they're the only ones looking. If we now take the largest planet in the solar system, the planet Jupiter, you can see, for example, this image taken by Pioneer 10 in 1974, or Pioneer 10, the first spacecraft to make a significant journey uh, beyond uh, Mars uh, into the outer solar system. And the amount of detail of cloud uh, festoons and um, turbulence and so on was pretty amazing. Uh, you see, of course, the black dot. There is, of course, a shadow um, of one of Jupiter's moons uh, on its surface. Uh, at least as I do this, I cannot pick up where the moon is located. So the moon looks so much like Jupiter in color that it is lost in the glare. You see the great red spot in the left side of the image, lower left. That's about three times the size of the Earth. And it is some kind of a... Um, high pressure system that has been around for at least 330 odd years. Uh, the coloration of it right there is far more salmon colored than we normally see it uh, today. Now let's move ahead and see what the amateurs might be doing say 40 something years later. And so once again we have an amateur image it's taken in 2017, so 43, 44 years later. You still see the uh, red spot, maybe slightly changed in shape, maybe just a little less distinct in the sense of red, but still very obvious. But we see now, in this case, two shadow transits. But what's also remarkable is that just to the left of, uh, well, the left of the shadow and slightly below center, you'll see the two moons that are creating the shadow. And they're very, very visible in the image, which is truly amazing. And again, the fact that this was taken not only from Earth, but also from an amateur is a striking thing. Um, a couple of other points, just while we have Jupiter on the screen here, if you look in the region uh, of the large belt, the South Equatorial Belt, um, just uh, where the red spot is indented, and then the other dark belt where the shadows of the moons happen to be, the North Equatorial Belt, uh, is a separation zone. So the area between those two is the equatorial area, and that is traveling um, 400 kilometers faster than the uh, areas to the north and south of it. And this creates a significant wind shear, which is probably why the belts are so turned up. And this is because Jupiter is mostly a fluid sphere. And so its rotation rate is not specific like the Earth would be because of it being a solid object. And the sun has the same phenomena. The center of this, the middle part of equator of the sun rotates about every 26 days, where the poles are more like 34. Now this image is even more spectacular because if you do look here at the moons, you'll notice that there's detail. So if I was to click on it yet again, we can start seeing now that there's detail here on the Galilean satellites. Now the right one, of course, is the space probe that's actually come here. And the left one is what we're seeing from Earth. And this is, again, a uh, <clears throat> you know, 60 centimeter telescope. Uh, and we're picking up something that's just a bit more of an arc second in diameter. It's a truly amazing accomplishment. are not restricted entirely to the amateur world. Here's the Cone Nebula in the National Geographic uh, Survey of 1950. And you can see some, some uh, background and so forth. Uh, and then uh, we now add a modern image. And those days, the black and white images were often used because uh, you had far more resolution, far more detail in a single black and white image than you try to do if you try to do color. So now we make it a modern image, and you can see not only are we seeing color, but we're seeing phenomenal amount of detail as well.
Um, by the way, if you notice the crosses on the stars that uh, some people find very uh, artistic, uh, this is simply an artifact of a device called a spider that holds the secondary mirror of the telescope in place. There's very, very thin veins in both directions, but you do get some diffraction along those veins <clears throat> and the uh, extremely sensitive uh, detector will pick that up and you get this effect. And this is the vein that holds <clears throat> for for uh, very thin strands to hold the um, secondary mirror in place. And that's why you get the four uh, points on the stars. So another aspect of the changes has been the growth in amateur science. Now, prior to that, the, the amateurs did two basic things. They measured the brightness of stars and asteroids with great precision and track that over time. So you can see in the lower left here, there's a graph. It has the brightness on the left on the y-axis. On the x-axis, it says phase, but it's in effect time. And we see how this object varies over time. So then the reason for this variation has to be thought about by the smart people. But at least you have data that is of this object and its situation. It's, you know, what makes a star change its brightness by a factor of two or something is pretty remarkable. Such a large object. And uh, precision measurements of these things were done by this block device you see in the left center screen here called a stellar photometer. And this would measure the brightness of one star. I have one of these the units in my observatory, which you we'll see in the tour video and the idea here is to measure the brightness of stars very precisely uh, whose change in brightness is very subtle and therefore cannot be detected easily with the naked eye however with the newer telescopes and especially due to the more sensitive cameras so the amateur telescopes are, are slightly bigger six eight inch ten inch type telescopes have been around for 30 to 40 years uh, but uh, or even 16s perhaps but I think in general the serious amateurs probably getting them just a little bigger than they used to be but the big change isn't the amateur uh, telescopes themselves but rather the detectors and so for example you can have a, a high resolution spectrograph like you see in the upper right corner here attached <clears throat> to your telescope with just a standard uh, you know digital camera you see in the lower right corner here and what you get then is a spectrum with uh, not only the Balmer lines quite obvious with the star Altair here, but also you get the all these other fine lines to the spectrum as well. A truly amazing image. And an image like this to be taken by amateur astronomers prior to detection with uh, digital cameras was impossible. And so the poor man's version of such a spectrograph was a diffraction lens like this one here this one I have and the idea here is you take a picture of a star like you see in the lower right corner here upon which you will get a spectrum and then we can use software to profile this and what this does is gives us uh, a low resolution spectrum of the star now the plan I had was to use this so that my students of AP physics see could take these uh, spectrographs and then uh, use them to type the type of um, uh, star that these each one represented. Uh, unfortunately, this system isn't hasn't got adequate resolution to do that, and so I've kind of moved away from it. But at the time, it was kind of fun to try. Yet another aspect of the new technologies has been the one of aperture synthesis. This is something that probably you've never heard of if you're not interested in the hobby directly. It was originally done by the radio astronomers, but the basic idea is let's start off with uh, say a telescope that has a an aperture of say two feet in diameter. And what we're going to do is we're going to put <clears throat> a cover over the front of that telescope and we're going to leave two holes, one near one edge and one near another edge. And what we find is, is that we get an image, while dimmer, of course, it is going to be a sharper uh, than uh, just as sharp as the telescope would be if the cover was removed. 
And uh, so if we were to now take the geometric opposite of that and have two telescopes uh, independently uh, taking images at the same time, you should be able to recombine the signal from those two in such a way that you model a telescope that would be the same diameter as the separation of the two telescopes. Now, radio waves are very long. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, radio signals and so forth and know that radio waves can be meters long uh, or more. And so millisecond um, accuracy for timing is usually sufficient. Uh, to <clears throat> combine two radio or more radio telescopes. Now, because the photons and so forth and the signal from a rotoscope is so large geometrically, this means that we really need a really large apertures to be able to provide any kind of detail. <clears throat> and uh, so what uh, they could do initially was when we got this technology is you can record the measurements from the radio telescope and you could record the time on video cassette type things the way they were in the 1970s. And then you simply send those video cassettes to a central place and they put them in players and using computers, we can match them up and get the enhancement of the details. And this is what they were successful at doing. And, and to the point where they would do something called VLBI, very long baseline interferometry. So what you would have is a case where we have a telescope in California and one in, say, I don't know, Nevada, one in Texas, one in West Virginia, and, and combine them all. And you end up with a radio telescope that has a virtual diameter of, you know, 2,000 miles or something. And this was quite remarkable. If we look at the two radio images here on the left-hand side of the uh, image, this, this colored one here, you'll see that they look um, quite different. But the left one is a single radio image. This, the right one is the one due to the combination of many of them from different sites. And so you can see the <clears throat> precision of the location of the radio sources is far tighter uh, in the right image. Now, <clears throat> because this had potential, they also decided to make a, a custom designed one, the VL Very Large Array, which is uh, in New Mexico. And uh, what they do, the, and the reason they put it there, of course, is you want a place where it's radio quiet. You don't want other radio signals affecting your data. But the nice part about this is it's shaped as a Y, and you can move the telescopes along on railings, on uh, like railroad tracks, and position them precisely, instead of kind of taking what you get, which is what you do with VLBI. And this makes that particular one one of the most sensitive radio telescopes in the world. But to move on then from the radio to the optic world is a real technical challenge. Um, you see on the uh, middle right the image of the two Keck telescopes. Now Keck one was built around 1990, the 10 meter mirror, everybody was very excited. Uh, within about 10 years they built Keck two with the idea that they could combine the two of these telescopes and generate a telescope whose virtual aperture would be the distance between the two telescopes, which is pretty amazing. It's probably 50 odd meters. However, technically this is extremely difficult and they played with this for about 10 years and ultimately have decided to set it aside. But I will still show you some of the results from it. The European uh, Southern Observatory in uh, Chile uh, has the very large telescope and you can see the four telescopes there. They're all combined using interferometry uh, and what that allows is for much larger images uh, in the sense of scale and so forth to be taken because you can combine the signals from all four of these identical telescopes. You see in the lower left the large binocular telescope, two eight meter diameter mirrors that uh, will image the night sky as if there was a mirror there the size of both telescopes combined. Uh, and we see, for example, the star SS Laporis in the lower part where you have the blue star, the, the hotter blue star orbiting a cooler red star. And from that, we can make inferences about the mass of both objects. So this is yet another example of a truly amazing innovation, which is also very, very demanding electronically 
uh, mechanically and, and computationally. And yet, uh, of course, the problem with the atmosphere, while it is certainly life-giving to people, it distorts the light at the last instant as it comes across the universe to Earth. And so since the 1960s or so, we've been trying to beat the atmosphere using all kinds of creations. So the um, first idea was to go about the atmosphere. So we would deal with balloons and airplanes. So you can see on the upper right here, that is actually a, a 747SP special performance that actually has a door that opens up and there's a telescope there. Uh, we had elementary rockets that would go up and take uh, um, some basic measurements. But it wasn't until the 1980s and into the 90s, <clears throat> the United States government decided to send up its series of great observatories that would, for the first time, with a, a, a top-notch instrument, um, measure the cosmos at these different parts of the spectrum. And then that data, we could begin to ha have a much fuller picture of what the, the uh, universe was doing. And the one field, uh, band we didn't have to worry about was radio. That works pretty well on the ground. So you can see in the lower right corner, we had, of course, the Compton Observatory. Uh, it's, it's, it's been deorbited, but it worked very well. And we became aware of a new phenomena in the gamma ray world and the idea of, of gamma ray bursters, perhaps two black holes coming together, who knows what, but very energetic uh, <clears throat> objects. <clears throat> the Chandra ultraviolet. A telescope or x-ray telescope i guess in this case um, has been uh, looking at in this case you can see here probably a pulsar it looks like of course the hubble space telescope in the visuals has so many beautiful images and then we have finally <clears throat> the uh, spitzer infrared telescope uh, which is um, looking at the universe in the infrared now, if you follow the expansion of the universe, you'll know that the further back you go, everything is shifted further to the red. So looking at the infrared aspect does two things. One is it allows us to look further back, but also it allows us to look through dust. So, for example, looking towards the center of the galaxy, there's so much dust in the way that we really can't see things. But looking with an infrared telescope, you can. And, uh, the, uh, so, and this uh, telescope is named after Leon Spitzer, or Lyman Spitzer, rather, the, one of the first proponents of space-based observatories. As I said in the previous slide, one of the interests was to begin to get data across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. As we can see by the graph, the transmission of the atmosphere is irregular. Uh, if we go from left to right, from gamma right down to radio, you can see that the atmosphere is opaque to gamma rays and x-rays and most of the UV. Now, we're very appreciative of that since there's, those are a tremendous biohazard. The atmosphere is now, for the most part, clear to the fairly narrow range of visual waves you can see going straight up. And then it has partial transmission of infrared energy, which is nice as well, given how cold it would be without that. Uh, then there's a blocking of the uh, infrared spectrum, uh, and then it opens up again uh, for the radio. And there's a very wide band of radio where it's basically completely transparent until we get to extremely long wavelengths, which are then once again blocked. Now imagine if you take your favorite music and you put it in a computer or something uh, using a, uh, an equalizer and played only one of the frequency bands at maximum and the other ones were all set down to zero. How strange your <clears throat> song would sound. And you're not getting the full story, if you will, of the song. And that's exactly the same thing that we're looking at with these objects is we're not getting the full story by looking at them only in the visual um, part of the spectrum. So this is why effort was made when rocket and space travel finally became practical to, to send complex and uh, well-considered instruments into orbit to, uh, to make these observations. Without getting into the physics too much, uh, but here's an example of a fairly famous object, the Crab Nebula, which is located in the constellation Taurus. It is the remnant of an exploded star, a 
back in 1054 recorded by a number of cultures. And here are six images showing the same object being observed under different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the radio image of this object is taken here by the very large array. That's the Y-shaped collection of radio telescopes in the New Mexican desert. The infrared uh, radiation spectrum is coming from the Spitzer Space Telescope, named after Lyman Spitzer, a, a scientist at the RAND Corporation who in the 1940s suggested the uh, profound use of space-based observatories and is in time overdue for his name to be uh, recognized. Then we have the visual uh, image of the Crab Nebula taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is one we might be familiar with. The ultraviolet radiation image is taken in this particular case from the Astro-1 payload. This was a flight of the space shuttle uh, back in the 90s uh, where they would have a payload bay filled with astronomical uh, instruments and for the best part of two weeks and they would affect observations of the sky and this is an image they took uh, in the ultraviolet of the uh, Crab Nebula. Uh, if we move on to the Chandra X-ray Observatory, this is lower energy. X-ray is a fairly large part of the spectrum. So these low energy, or what they call soft X-rays, um, the nebula is pretty much X-ray quiet, except right at the center. And this object that you see, this purple object here, is, of course, very, very small uh, and would hardly show up as a point in the other images. Uh, at the center of it, we believe that there is a pulsar, a rapidly rotating neutron star, uh, that is where the is the remnant of what's left of the star that exploded uh, roughly a thousand years ago. And we move over here to the final X-ray image, the hard X-ray image. This is done by a balloon-based uh, telescope, 15-minute uh, exposure. And uh, this is looking probably right at the pulsar proper, the only place where you'd have any significant uh, X-ray production. So it just shows you uh, the, how informative and how radically different these different parts of the spectrum are with the same object. So this uh, graphic you have at the top, the light coming in from the universe, it's all very regular. It hasn't been affected really at all. And in the last just split second, as it goes through the atmosphere, because of the turbulence in the atmosphere, you get affected. The waveforms get disturbed. And this causes blurring. Uh, you can see it if you look across a hot parking lot or plowed field in the summertime. But of course, when you're using a big telescope and you're magnifying things, you're magnifying not only the thing you're interested in, you're magnifying all the consequences as well, including the Earth's atmosphere. So to make the best of our large telescopes, we have to do something about this because the biggest problem with the big telescopes is that the seeing conditions, as we call it, in the sense of turbulence, is can be different on one side of the telescope than the other. The telescope is so big that the atmosphere above it, there's actually differences between side to side, something that doesn't happen with smaller instruments. So the first way that we use the technique we use to try to reduce the effects of the atmosphere is what we call lucky imaging. This is used extensively by amateur astronomers and may well have been used a little bit by the professionals in the beginning. So in the upper right corner of the slide you see an astronomically designed a webcam. Uh, this is designed for very low light conditions. Um, it may have a small cooler on it to keep it a bit cooler. These cameras are more effective when they're a bit colder. And uh, it generally shoots uh, 30 frames a second. The cheaper webcams, you don't get to um, modify the exposure rates. Whatever, um, this is plugged into the telescope. And let's take the planet Jupiter. We're obviously using fairly bright objects here. So if we take a look at the planet Jupiter and we take an image uh, video of it, say for 90 seconds, under what appear to be pretty good conditions. So what will happen now is the first thing that we want to achieve as best we can is a good focus on the telescope itself. 
and then if we take 90 seconds of video that's 2700 images in the 90 seconds that's pretty amazing now the atmospheric turbulence is a slower phenomena and so when you shoot a frame that lasts only a thirtieth of a second this effectively freezes whatever turbulence is going on at an instant in the days of photographic film we used to have to shoot pictures high high magnification pictures of let's say Jupiter or Saturn that might have to last uh, two or three seconds and in that length of time the atmosphere could smear the image and it would always leave the images looking softer after we've done this uh, 2700 images if you will of Jupiter or Saturn or whatever we then can run this through software which will choose what they call the best 10% or the best 20% or the best 200 or whatever way you want to set it up uh, frames and there's algorithms in the computer that decide which ones are the best or they're the uh, sharpest to the most together way they look at it and uh, and they will select those and you have you can modify some parameters on some of the software uh, after that this the uh, software will center these images so they all line up geometrically because they may move around a little bit on the screen due to atmospheric turbulence and so on and then it will average them now what this does is the random noise will cancel out and in, and the uh, information the things that are real will be enhanced and then you divide by the number of pictures or whatever number you want to and this gives you the average image after what we call stacking now we're not finished now we now have an image that has reduced noise and then we can turn around and use mathematical algorithms to enhance the image further and you can see the effect of those in the lower left corner uh, the right hand side would be a raw image which always looked terrible and the left hand side would be a processed one after uh, stacking and averaging and image processing and so these software programs do this and you do not have to be some crazy math wizard but more a matter of understanding what the thing is trying to do and this gives us uh, resolutions that just you couldn't dream about um, with this type of equipment years ago and the other thing too is the amateur telescopes that are built today are, are for the most part built by computer so the optical figure in them is many, often far better than what you used to get so here we have a lucky imaging example that's right up front so on the right hand side you see an image of Jupiter uh, this is I'm just guessing by looking at it probably a stacked average image uh, if we had if I had gotten an image from a camera uh, with a photograph of this quality I would have been ecstatic in the old days uh, before I moved on to other types of work so uh, just to show you the difference here so when you after you have all of this if, if well, this is a raw image which is all you'd ever get with the old methods anyway so then you're going to select stack average and image process and you would get something that looks like the one on the left and this is truly amazing because what's fun about this is that you can also begin to track these features on Jupiter you can also make a movie uh, I have friends of mine who do this and they would Jupiter's rotation is quite significant I mean the whole planet rotates in roughly 10 just under 10 hours so you could take a, an image like this every 15 minutes or whatever and uh, put it together in sort of like a cartoon animation and you get a very good sense of the planet rotating and you could begin to pick up motions of the gases and so forth so there's just things to do uh, as an amateur even uh, with respect to planets 700 million kilometers away that just were not possible years ago so a fancier version of trying to reduce the atmospheric turbulence in our images uh, was affected by the United States government in the 1980s now here on the upper left corner we have President Ronald Reagan and the urban legend has it that President Reagan went to the movies uh, as movie actors do 
and he saw some version of Star Wars and saw the, the good guys shooting down the bad guys with laser beams and walked away thinking, gosh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could use the same technology to shoot down potential uh, Soviet uh, intercontinental missiles as they came over the United States. Now, thankfully, we never needed to do so. But at the time, during President Reagan's time, especially in the early 80s, the tensions between the Soviet Union and the United States were significant. And he went ahead with over a billion dollars of seed funding to get the uh, scientists and the engineers to try and come up with satellites that could literally do this. Now, there are, of course, legal ramifications as well. We're not supposed to have weapons in space and all the rest. Uh, President Reagan perhaps didn't seem to be too bothered by that, but that was uh, another factor that would have had to have been dealt with. Now, at the same time, so they got to a certain point, of course, with the work on all this. And the Soviet Union uh, has two choices. It can try and find a defense mechanism of its own, but it probably didn't have the technical acumen at the time to do so. Or it can make way more missiles to overwhelm a system like this one. Uh, either way, uh, it was seen as a destabilizing move. Uh, but uh, sanity intervened in the mid-1980s. Uh, Gorbachev came to power and the tensions began to wane. Uh, and ultimately, the Soviet Union fell apart and the need for this very expensive, complex system was no longer necessary. It was seen to be superfluous. But astronomy was the big victor in this case. <clears throat> and the technology worked basically on the following principle. You take an observatory like you see on the left there, <clears throat> and it will be looking at somewhere in the night sky and you'll shoot a laser out of a certain wavelength yellow green I believe is typical and around 90 kilometers it will excite molecules in the upper atmosphere of the earth and this will create <clears throat> an, a point of light and based on the physics of what it's doing we understand what that's supposed to look like this is designed <clears throat> to be in the field of view of the image we're taking of a galaxy or whatever object we're interested in. And so when we see this image, the raw image that's first coming in, we're going to be looking for this artificial star we've created. It will be distorted. And what can happen now is we can say, okay, in real time, because of the computer power we have, we can take this distorted image recognize what we need to do to make it back into what it's supposed to look like. Now we use this um, mirror that you see in the holder on the right. This is an extremely thin, very uh, deformable mirror that's held by a whole bunch of piezoelectric cables. Now piezoelectricity is a device where you have a crystal that will change its shape uh, because of the amount of voltage that's been applied to it. And it works very rapidly. So the idea would be that the computer would look across the entire zone of this image and say, okay, here are the changes we need to do to this image to make it um, what it was supposed to be. And then in real time, the signals be sent, the mirror would be deformed, and the image of the entire object that we were looking at is sent in real time uh, to the detector. Now, of course, the scene conditions are changing as we go. So this is a constant updating process and it's happening so fast that um, what gets to the detector is vastly improved. And you can see this in the bottom image here. On the left is the unaffected image where the image correction system is not operating. On the right, of course, you have a very nice little double star. So this um, technology uh, is basically essential for large telescopes because of their susceptibility to differential scene conditions across their apertures. And maybe one other point, of course, is that the air traffic authorities are not very happy about astronomers pointing bright lasers at the sky. Uh, now, that depends on where you're located as to how many airplanes are flying in this area. But certainly in the United States, uh, you basically have to have someone outside watching. And if an airplane comes anywhere near where you're pointing the laser, you have to shut the laser off for, you know, 30 seconds or whatever while the airplane travels through. And then you can turn it back on again. And there's pretty significant problems if you don't do that, as, of course, it can damage, uh, like affect the pilot's vision and so on.
So here we are in uh, 2017, and so basically 120 years since uh, the first inventory. We have telescopes that are now four times larger, uh, so this gives us far more light and, of course, all kinds of new crazy geometries. Uh, as remote as sites as you can imagine that would have been completely off limits in the old days. We're observing remotely in many cases by sending images and data over the Internet. Uh, the telescopes are constructed and operated by computers. They're super precise. There's far more telescopes. There's far more astronomers. Uh, we have telescopes in space now as well as on the ground. We're combining information from one or more telescopes, especially in the radio, <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to give us far more detail, something that also wouldn't have been possible without computers. We move over to detectors. They're all electronic. They're super fast. They're linear in the sense that an image multiplies as you over the time, uh, and they're super efficient. Uh, backlit CCDs now are, are, observe, are detecting somewhere almost to 90% of the incident photons compared to half a percent in the old days. We have image processing, which allows for calibration of our images and, of course, an enormous generational improvement in the image themselves. And we're using adaptive optics one way or the other to beat the atmosphere and this is far cheaper than space-based telescopes. So you can make arguments that visual telescopes on the ground now are so good that maybe we don't, the Hubble, although it does a great job, um, that we're not replacing it with another visual telescope, replacing it with an infrared telescope. So that the space-based telescopes will be those telescopes where this light does not get to the ground and there's simply nothing we can do about it. So now we find ourselves in the situation of a final accounting of how much all of these modifications and improvements have truly made. And we certainly have the subjective examples of the images, but let's just look at the numbers as well. So we can see here that the size of the telescopes is approximately four times bigger than it was back then. And if we look at, say, that depends, I guess it might be not quite as big, but if we go back to 1900, it certainly would be. The quality of the mirror, um, twice as good. That might be a little conservative given the computer polishing that we have today, but uh, that being said, uh, the opticians of the old days were pretty good at their work as well. So either way, we're probably doing a little better than we were before. The location of the telescopes is giving us two things. One is that we're higher, so we're dealing with a less atmosphere to look through at the deserts and the mountaintops. We're dealing with a drier atmosphere. We're dealing with uh, less rain, less inclement, less clouds. And these locations are unbelievably dark. Uh, I was talking to someone once who had a chance to attend at the Southern Observatory location and had gone to the bathroom and came back and was walking along the pathway and noticed his shadow on the ground. He looked up and the only thing that was in the sky was the center of our galaxy. He was seeing his shadow by the light of the center of the galaxy. So the darkness that they have in those sites you just can't imagine anywhere else. The detectors is the big difference. The efficiencies of the backlit CCD camera at around 85 to 90% compared to the old fashioned 0.5 to 1% efficient photographic plates has truly made a generational influence. The ability to image process <clears throat> is, as you can see from the earlier parts of this presentation, it makes a profound difference in what we can divine from images. And later on, for data mining and other things, enhancement of things is also making it remarkably effective. The adaptive optics, one way or the other, allowing us to see perhaps 10 times or so the resolution we would get without the effect of adaptive optics. I would suggest in some cases it's greater than this. So if we multiply these numbers out, you get something like 64,000 times uh, improvement in the ability of the image one way or the other. And I think that bears itself out with some of the 
uh, images I was showing you earlier. Not only are they so much better, but they're being made by such a, a comparative inferior camera. I could show you professional images, but then we get into a situation where you're not quite sure what we're looking at and there's complexity to it. So I thought it was better to show the comparison this way. Now, I had mentioned the issue of combining the optical telescopes and how difficult that was. And uh, this rare special technique is used uh, sparingly because it's fairly consumptive of telescope time. But here we go. Here's the constellation Orion, and the upper left corner is the bright star uh, Betelgeuse, which currently is dimmer than this because of dust. Now, if we were to take a voyage and go closer, uh, we can see what we can pull out of this. And here is this remarkable image of the actual surface of the star Betelgeuse, taken by the optical interferometer, and my understanding was at the Keck telescope. Now, this star is so large that the dotted line you see there is the actual orbit of the planet Mars. So this star is so big that its actual physical size is halfway to the planet Jupiter. So one more comparison. On the left hand side you see the very famous Hubble Space Telescope image from around 1995 of the gaseous pillars in the Eagle Nebula M16. Uh, these pillars are large, of course, and inside are stars forming that are ultimately producing solar systems. We think that the gas that's and dust that's part of these pillars may well have been blown away by some of the stars on the other side due to the ultraviolet radiation. However, um, one of my friends, using his homemade 8-inch uh, reflecting telescope, took a picture of the same region of the sky and um, and I zoomed in on it to give it the same scale. So you can see the resolution that this uh, homemade telescope for a few thousand dollars uh, has compared to the uh, expensive optical one. The other thing to remember too is that the one on the right is the image that we're generally getting uh, from this object with all of the hydrogen alpha emission from the gas cloud. Uh, the one on the left, I suspect, may well have some false color in it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this voyage uh, through the history, uh, the modern history, really, of astronomical observing. Thanks again for watching.